الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه أما بعد My brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله It is nice to be here uh, and it's always very interesting to travel to different cities within Canada As I mentioned, this is my country I'm born here um, Yes, my parents come from other countries outside of Canada uh, they were born there and came to this country, but subhanAllah for me, Canada is huge and it's vast. And as we see here in the community, it's, you know, as some of the brothers are saying, we sometimes have only a hundred families. Or at the beginning when he came, there was only 43 families, right? And so subhanAllah, this is a good sign that our numbers are growing, our communities are growing. And from amongst us, inshaAllah ta'ala, we are expanding and reaching out to others. And so it's always a pleasure to come to different cities, different uh, areas within, uh, within Canada to see how the Muslims are living and reacting and interacting with one another. And the reason why I say reacting is because the reality is, amongst the Muslimin, we react with one another. Forget about those outside of Islam. Let's talk about within Islam. Within our own selves, we react to one another. Sometimes a person wants something, another doesn't, and so there's conflict in between two people or two parties and so on and so forth. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us in the Qur'an, وَاَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا وَذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذْ كُنْتُمْ أَعْدَاءً فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ Now of course these verses are with regards to a specific situation that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was addressing that the uh, Ansar and the Muhajireen, they now became brothers of one another, yet prior to Islam, they were enemies to each other. They were enemies to each other. Their cultures were so similar, their tribes were so similar, their environment was similar, their uh, nature was similar, their language was similar. A lot of things was very similar or were similar amongst them or between them. But yet at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminded them that they should come together and hold on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which means unity. And before we get into gender interaction or gender relations, it's important for us to come together in <coughs> unity. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us, now of course when I say come together in unity, I'm not saying brothers and sisters come together, right? I'm saying brothers and brothers, sisters and sisters, right? And so... Uh, the Prophet ﷺ, he tells us, what was I going to say? Did I say the Prophet ﷺ? Yeah? I forgot what I was going to say. So the Prophet ﷺ, eh? About unity. Unity, yes. Uh, we mentioned, وَعَتَسِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Also the Prophet ﷺ, yes, جزاكم الله خيراً, he reminds us in a hadith, very famous, <coughs> Should I tell you about something, guide you towards something, that if you were to do it, it would unite your hearts, it would bring you together, you would be together, united, just like one body. And when one body is together, there's strength. And our Muslim communities nowadays need more strength than ever. You can see what's happening around the world, but we see what's happening in, in our country every single morning we wake up. Every morning you wake up, you open the news, you're having your breakfast, your chai, your shai, your whatever you want to have, your paraka, your laddus, your chum chums, your sweets, whatever it is that you have in the mornings. And you're watching the news and you're realizing, subhanAllah, every single day something new is happening. And what's even worse is that our leader now is instilling hatred and Islamophobia within our own communities, within our cities, within our provinces, within our own country. And so this is something that we now need to learn to deal with. And the Prophet ﷺ reminds us, like I said, what is it that he wants us to do or advised us to do that will bring us together? Afshu salama baynakum. Spread the salam. Give salam to one another. And this is really good what we just did now. It's really good to see that we are introducing each other and sometimes, you know, you stand in the same row of the salah and you pray next to each other maybe daily, maybe weekly. Some might live far from the masjid. They come for Jum'ah, right? And you stand next to people that you've never asked what your name is before. Yet you see them all the time in the masjid. But we just never take the time to ask. 
And we should start by saying salam. Spread salam. When you give salam to someone, you're not just giving them a statement, conveying a statement from one person and then receiving a, a statement back. You're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send His peace and His blessings upon that person. You are looking out for the safety of that person. You want them to be protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so before you actually even know their name, you're making a dua of protection upon this person. Asking Allah to protect them. Because you know their name might be Muhammad. Their name might be Walter. Their name might be Michael. Their name might be Stephen. Their name might be Usama. Their name might be Abdullah or Muhammad or uh, you know some other name. But you still stand in the same row. You still pray the same way. You still worship the same Allah. And so before we even start to divide ourselves in terms of names and cultures and all that, we come together on the, on the unity or in unity under the banner of the Shahada. Under the banner of the Shahada. And when it comes to gender relations, now we said that unity is important. Before we get into unity after, uh, sorry, before we get into gender relations, after we mention unity, what's important is for us to focus on building our Iman. How do we build our Iman? And what's the purpose of building Iman? When we talk about gender relations, we always pose the question, am I allowed to talk to he or she? What's the limit? How much can I deal with this person? Can we go and have coffee together or not? Should there be a parda between us or not? Which is a, a proper segregation, like an actual physical wall or not. And before we discuss this, it's important for us to remember to build our iman. Because when you build your iman, and you recognize Allah, and you're conscious and aware that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that is above and beyond our own knowledge, that we see in front of ourselves right now. Right now I see Hisham, I see Talha, I see everyone in front of me, and I see a bottle of water, and I see a table, and I see a phone, and I see my own hands. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees even the things that we, with our eyes, don't see. He could tell when there's tension between people. He could tell when you have something in your heart against someone else. He could tell when you have something in your heart for someone else as well. When you're attracted to someone. When there's some sort of chemistry that's happening between two people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows it. And when we build that barrier, that barrier of Iman, which is a strength of Iman, it places a barrier between us and the person in committing sin. Now initially when I had prepared this for this topic, I thought there would be a lot more youth, right? Because Adnan told me there would be a lot more youth probably for this topic, right? And alhamdulillah, I think we're all youth. Regardless of our age, we're all children. We all have a mother and a father and they always consider us their child. No matter how old we get. Right? And so it's important for us to realize that whether we are young, as some of the children, or we are middle-aged, like 20, 30, 40, or we're more than that, 50, 60, 70, we still will always have desires. We'll always have desires. And when it comes to interaction, Islamically, what is permissible? What are we allowed to do? Let me give you a scenario and you tell me how you respond to this. We just finished talking about the salam. The Prophet ﷺ told us that the salam, when you spread salam amongst yourselves, you will build unity. Your hearts will come together. So you're walking down the street. Or you're, what's the shopping mall? Is there, is Orchard there? Park. Orchard's Park. So you're going through Orchard's Park, right? I've never seen it, I don't even know if it even exists. <laughs> so you're going through this mall. And as you're walking through it, you're a brother. Okay? Imagine yourself, you're a brother. You're walking through this mall. And in front of you, you see a Muslim sister walking the other way. You know she's a Muslim sister because she's wearing her hijab. She's wearing something that looks like an abaya. You can tell by her physical appearance, this is a Muslim sister. 
Now, how do we as Muslims react? When we are walking down the street and we see another Muslim brother or sister of the opposite gender, should we give salam or not? Scenario number one is, you're walking down the street, or you're walking through the mall, you see her, and as you get closer, you just keep walking with your head down. You all of a sudden became very pious. You're now the Mawlana and the Shaykh, right? You became very pious. You don't say anything to her, you don't look at her, you pretend as though you never even saw her, even though you made eye contact from a distance. Scenario number two, you're walking by, and you say, Assalamu alaikum. And you continue to walk. You don't stop. You continue to walk. And you go about your business. Scenario number three. You're walking through the mall again. You see that same sister. She's coming your way. And as she's walking towards you, like, Assalamu alaikum. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, right? And you're like making it sound with your voice that you're somehow interested. Right? And then we can keep going on and going on and going on with scenarios. You can stop and talk. You can stop and ask, how are you? Do you need something? Shall I buy something for you? Right? You're trying to prove that you're the man and so on and so forth. Which scenario? Ask yourself, which scenario are you? Which scenario are we? When it comes to spreading salam, even between brother and sister, or sister and brother, are we spreading salam? Are we interacting the way that the Prophet ﷺ encouraged us to interact? <coughs> we said, when you give salam to someone, you're sending peace and blessings upon them. You're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's as though you're raising your hands to Allah, and you're asking Him to protect this person. And even more so when we see a sister, we should be making more dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Especially at our times now. When things are changing around us. When our sisters are scared to even wear the hijab now. They're scared to walk the streets. They don't know if someone's going to throw something at them. Someone's going to yell at them. Someone's going to swear at them. And I don't know how it is in Kelowna. I've only been here for a few hours now. But Canada itself, we can see that things are changing. Alhamdulillah. It doesn't seem so bad here. I come from Montreal, the province of Quebec. It's bad there. I've been told, take the leash off of your dog. Referring to my wife, who's wearing a hijab. Take the leash off of your dog. By a lady who's holding her dog in her hand with the leash in the other hand. Imagine that. And she's walking out of a veterinarian. And she's telling me, take the leash off of your dog. Let her be free, in French. Thinking I come from a different country. And then when I say, excuse me, she says, go back to your country. We don't need you here, in French. Thinking, I don't know what she's saying. And then I respond in French. The Moroccan brothers know. I respond in French. And, huh, whoa. What's going on? She's shocked. She doesn't realize I'm a product of this society. Yes, we speak your language. Here you speak English, right? In Quebec mostly you speak French. And so we interact with people in the language that they speak as well. We eat the same foods. We're human beings. We drink the same water. It comes out of our tap just like it comes out of theirs. We go to the same schools and universities and educational institutions, right? We share the same currency. Just because some of us may have come from a different country doesn't mean we continue to use that currency in Canada. We use Canadian dollars, right? And so when you see a Muslim sister walking down the street, it should be even more important for you to send salam to this person. And vice versa. You wish for her protection. You wish for her to be safe. You wish for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the rest of her life to be the guardian on, upon this person. But sadly today we think that Islam tells us we have to have complete barriers between us. Let's take an example of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His masjid, Masjid al-Nabawi, right? In the city of Madinatul al 
at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, how was the masjid? The masjid, to be honest, was not much bigger than yours. In fact, it's probably the exact same size as your masjid here. So imagine that this is Masjid al Nabawi at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Right? In this direction, the direction you're facing. The brothers, where do they pray? In the front. They start making their rows from the front. Right? Where do the sisters make their rows? Not from where this middle section starts, like the wall, and they start making the rows from the front. Islamically, the women are supposed to make their rows beginning from the back. Beginning from the back. So let's just say, to make it easy to understand, the Imam is standing there and he's praying, just like we normally do, just like we just did. And the brothers start here and they make their rows. And hypothetically, let's just say that there's no wall in between us. And so sisters come in and they want to pray. Do they see the brothers standing here and so they start to make their row here? No, they don't. They start to make their row there, in the back, the furthest away from the brothers. Do they go and carry a partition and bring a partition and divide them? No, they don't. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us through the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam that your segregation is the fact that the men are in the front and the women are in the back. That is your segregation. When brothers walk through, let's just say the sisters are praying in the middle, and brothers come through the door and they see the sisters, and the sisters might be in ruku or in sujood. That's a fitna for some brothers. That's a mushkila. That's a problem. They see this, they're like, oh, astaghfirullah, I need to go make wudu again. Right? This is a problem. But if the sisters make their roles from the back, there's hikmah in what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has descended upon us. This is my point. My point is the deen has hikmah in it that we don't understand. And when we start to implement our own ways, then we start to complicate things. Now I'm not saying don't use a partition. Don't get me wrong. And not saying do not put a partition between you. If you want to, great. Alhamdulillah. But it should not be something that is made a condition Islamically because it isn't. Let's use another example. I can show you pictures right now if we had internet connection. We can go online right now and pull up pictures of a masjid in Indonesia. In the capital. The biggest masjid. Where the imam is standing there in the front and right behind the imam is actually the row going out the masjid. There's no one standing there. To his right are the sisters to his left are the brothers. And there's thousands of them standing in the masjid praying. Thousands. Now, mentally, when we try to use our logic and apply it to the deen in ways that go against what the Prophet ﷺ taught us, we create confusion. Why do we create confusion? Because now rows in that masjid, for example, meet. Brothers and sisters meet. And so they turn that into a walkway. So people want to come and go, they can come and go in the middle. Why would you need to come and go in the middle while salah is taking place? Right? It's because we've confused ourselves. We've complicated our deen in ways that the Prophet ﷺ did not complicate. His masjid at his time وسلم, had no partition, no physical barrier. When the companions عنهم, finished their salah, they would sit down in their adhkar and the sisters, the, the female companions would leave. When they were gone, the male companions would get up and leave. Was there any issue? There was no issue. When they went into the markets, were the markets or the marketplace, was it restricted to men? Were there signs that said men only? No, there wasn't. It was open to both men and women. We know that Khadija anha, was one of the most, uh, one of the most blessed, we could say, businesswomen. That she excelled in business. Now, yes, people are going to argue, okay, this was before Islam. But even after Islam, did the Prophet ﷺ forbid women from doing the business? No, he didn't. Right? 
And so we see that there's different types of gender interaction within our deen. And we'll get into these different types now, insha'Allah ta'ala. My point is, who decides? Who gets to decide when it comes to gender interaction? And it is none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who decides. And this goes back to the initial statement that I made. It's important for us to increase in our iman in order to have proper segregation between us. When our iman is strong, you can see two individuals of different genders who come together in an area and they could do whatever they want with each other. They can indulge in whichever sins they enjoy. But if they have iman, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us on the Day of Judgment, if these two people fear the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the extent as the Prophet sallallahu <coughs> shows us in the hadith, سَبْعَةٌ يُظِلُّهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي ظِلِّهِ يَوْمَ لَا ظِلَّ إِلَّا ظِلُّ That these two people can indulge in anything that they want. No one would know. Not even the stars in the sky would see them. But yet, they're conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they say, or one of them says, إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهُ I fear Allah. Whether they say it out loud or they say it inside of them is irrelevant. The point is, because of their consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they leave that situation. They come away from that situation. So when we have iman, we protect ourselves from uh, the issue of gender uh, interaction. Now let's talk a little more realistic. Our lives. What are we going through? Some of you going through university, some of you working, some of you are parents, some of you are not parents, right? Some are young adults, some are new couples, some have young children, some have older children, right? Some don't have children, so we're of all different ages. <coughs> when we go to work, or we go to university, how should we interact with the opposite gender? That's a question. How do we interact with the opposite gender? What are the limitations? What are we allowed to do? What are we not allowed to do? And whenever you're stuck and you can't figure out what you should do, ask yourself, what did the Prophet ﷺ do? And if that doesn't work for you, ask yourself, if he ﷺ was here right now, in my situation, where I'm standing, what would he do? We know that he was rahmatun lil alameen. He was sent as a mercy to all of mankind. He was sent to bring the hearts together. He was sent to mend the issues and the problems that people had. And so are we doing that? When we see people of the opposite gender, we sometimes tend to take a very harsh stance. Right? We take a harsh stance. Or we take an extremely lenient stance. We go to the opposite ends of the spectrum. We do ghulu beyond ghulu. Right? <coughs> we are either too lenient or too uh, severe, too extreme. And this is something that we need to try and control. So at universities, for example, we have co-ed classes. And I know Adnan was telling me about this. So we sit in co-ed classes, right? And then when it comes to an Islamic event, we have a barrier dividing the brothers and the sisters. Is this permissible? Yes, it's permissible. Is it advisable? <coughs> Probably, yeah, it's advisable to have segregation. But what type of segregation? We now sometimes see that people become offended. Oh, why do you have to put a wall or a curtain between us? Just have the sisters on one side, the brothers on the other side, right? What's the problem? What's the issue? The issue is, brothers and sisters, we don't respect each other enough. How many of the scholars of the past had female teachers? 
How many of the scholars of the past had female teachers? Now we know that Aisha radiallahu anha and the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were learned. And women would come to learn from them as well as men. And the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were commanded to actually have that physical barrier between them. Whether it was the niqab or whether it was a canvas hanging their home behind some sort of curtain, that was something that was, that was uh, demanded or commanded upon them. And if it is commanded upon all of our women, then we're actually making a statement that the niqab is compulsory for every single woman to wear. That's the extent that we would go if we say that there has to be a physical barrier between men and women. And we know very well that the niqab is not something that is wajib. It is not compulsory to use or to wear. So therefore, how do we interact? If we have an Islamic gathering, like this for example, and the door is open, and if the sisters are there, and they want to see through, is there something wrong with that? Is there anything wrong with that? Let's take real life situations so we can actually understand. Some of us will feel that yes, it's wrong. I know growing up, coming from the Pakistani you know, culture, it is wrong. There should be an actual barrier, right? But then are we a little bit hypocritical sometimes? On the day of Eid, family comes over and everyone is just sitting together. Cousins and sisters and in-laws and so on. Why is it that we take such an extreme stance sometimes and not an extreme stance at others? That's because we apply our logic to the deen. That's because we apply our logic to the deen. And let me give you a simple example. Ali radiallahu anhu, when it came to wiping over the sock, doing mas, right? When we make wudu, sometimes if you already made wudu and you put your sock on while you had wudu, you can simply just wipe on your sock. Where on your sock do you wipe? Do you wipe the top of your sock? Do you wipe the bottom of your sock? Do you wipe the whole part of your sock? Where do you wipe? Tell me. The top. Where else? Just the top? Why? How do you walk on your feet? Do you walk like this on your feet? Or do you walk like this on your feet? When we walk, the bottom of our foot touches the ground, right? The bottom of our foot touches the ground. So why do we have to wipe over the top of our sock? Why do we do that? Shouldn't we use logic and wipe the bottom of our sock because that's what's dirty? Logically, it makes sense, right? But the Prophet ﷺ taught us otherwise. It's not what makes sense to us logically. It's what makes sense to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with His infinite wisdom and hikmah. That we do what is pleasing to Him. And in that is some sort of wisdom, hikmah, that we don't understand. But we do it because it's pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So using our logic can twist the deen and make things very difficult. Getting back to our example, having the doors open and the sisters seen. Are the sisters allowed to look at the brothers? That was a question. Yes. What do you, uh, you tell me. I gave you the scenario. We're sitting here. The door is open. The sisters want to look in. Are the sisters allowed to look at the brothers? Very general question. Depends on what the brothers are wearing. Depends on what. So you know. Depends on their intention. Depends on their intention. Didn't the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam teach us a hadith in a statement that the first look is permissible? And what's the second look? The second look is not permissible. The second look is haram. Right? But what is meant by that? Does that mean that you come out of the masjid, your wife is looking for you, she looks up, doesn't see you, and that's it. She's not allowed to look up again. Now she has to stand there and wait. Because she looked up once, and that's the end of it. 
that look is a look of desire. If someone sees you and they have desire in you, and they're like, ooh, they feel that thing in them, ooh, right? <laughs> Chemistry, right? It's like vinegar mixed with baking soda. <laughs> Something happens, right? And so that look of desire, that is the look where you're not allowed to look again. So it's like, you know, we all know this, we're going to be very frank, because that's how I am. Very frank, because we need to learn. And so you're standing somewhere and you see someone, right? The brothers are standing, it's a very hot day, and there's a woman walking down the street, and she walks by and you look like, whoa, right? That second look, that was a haram look, because you wanted to look again. You didn't need to. But if the sisters are sitting there and they want to learn something, right? They should have haya. There's no barrier there. The Prophet ﷺ, he actually dedicated an entire day to teaching women. The women came to him and complained, you're always with the male companions, and you never give us any time. We have questions too. So he asked them which day you want and gave them a specific day that they wanted to come and learn from him and ask questions and just be around the Prophet ﷺ. Did he say, wait, first we need to put a barrier and you sit on the other side of the barrier, right? And then from a distance we will speak. I've been to Masajid, alhamdulillah, your masjid is just like this. The brothers are on one side, sisters are on the other side. I've been to some Masajid where the women's section is so segregated that if someone was to come inside the ladies' section and harm a woman, physically abuse her, or steal something, the men would be standing there praying and not even know that anything even happened. In fact, they'd be finished their prayer and not even know something happened. And they could come hours later and realize there's not a single woman left in there. They all, you know, got stolen. And then all the husbands are like, yes, alhamdulillah, my dua was accepted. <laughs> no, but the point is, sometimes our masajid segregate the men and the women so much to the extent that if the safety of our women was being jeopardized, we wouldn't even know it. Then I've been to some masajid that actually have signs on the outside that says, no women allowed. No women allowed? Really? Now yes, the Prophet ﷺ teaches us that we should not <laughs> forbid our women from coming to the masjid. But their homes are better for them. Right? Don't forbid them from coming to the masjid if they actually desire to come to the masjid. And when they come to the masjid, make them feel welcome. This is the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not our house. Your rules might apply in your house. This is the house of Allah. Use the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Legislate by the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it comes to the masjid. And I think we spoke about that enough and we're going to move on inshallah. But before I do that, the same thing applies if a brother was going to learn from a sister. There should be some sort of modesty in their behavior. They have to have hayat, right? Modesty. She should be dressed properly, he should be dressed properly. Today we have this big issue. Sisters complain to me more than ever about one thing. Brothers wear t-shirts that are so short we can tell the color of their underwear when they go in sujood. Yeah. And this happens in MSAs, like at you know, universities. It happens when we pray in public places. It happens when we pray at home sometimes. Where the sisters complain, we can see their backs when they go in sujood. And don't think the sisters are immune. It's not a good sight to start with. But sometimes it might be inviting. And so we need to be careful of this. Now, when it comes to you know, interaction at work, there has to be some sort of communication. Now, we don't shake hands with the opposite gender. But we can converse. There's nothing wrong with speaking to someone related to your actual business that you need to speak about. So for example, 
you're at an office job, IT or engineering, whatever it is, you're sitting there, you know, interacting with the people, and there's a, either a sister or a non-Muslim woman that you need to interact with, or vice versa. Uh, a Muslim sister needs to interact with a non-Muslim man. You have to use the laws that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permitted and not permitted. So no, you don't jump in a car together and go for lunch. You're not mahram for one another. But at the same time, if you need to discuss something, you discuss it in an area where it's open, and you speak to each other about the matter that needs to be discussed. When it's over, alhamdulillah, khalas, that's it, that's the end of it, you get up and you go. And you make it known in your behavior, not offending the other person, but known that I don't want to speak about anything more than what we need to speak about. Right? That's one thing. There's many other things that we can go through, subhanAllah, I have like dating and Islam, romance, religion, there's so many things, campus da'wah, this is a big problem as well for the students on campus who want to give da'wah to others. So you want to tell someone else about Islam, and you're talking to them about the deen, right? How do you interact with that person? How do you tell them about Islam? It's a non-Muslim woman that the brothers are walking up to. She's obviously not going to be dressed that appropriately, right? Are we allowed to do this? Yes, you're allowed to do it. But look down. Control your gaze. Right? If you feel there's some chemistry between you, get someone else to do it. Call someone else. Be like, you know what? There's this brother, he's, he's going to speak to you. Right? And get someone else to clarify for you. And the same thing for the sisters. Um, I, I want to actually touch <coughs> critical things here. But I'm going to finish up so you can ask questions, inshallah. You can always cover things in tomorrow's talk. Mm-hmm. You can cover things in tomorrow's talk. Youth That's right. We do have a talk tomorrow with youth, uh, the youth issues. And we can cover that as well. Um, but before we get into anything, inshallah ta'ala, a very important topic. Um, this is actually really relevant in Ontario right now. And it probably is relevant here, just that we haven't been woken up yet to it in Vancouver. The issue in Ontario is that the Ministry of uh, the Minister of Education uh, implemented a new or revised version of the uh, sex ed curriculum in schools. To the extent that grade one students are being taught things that most parents today would not even know, right? Things that are very detailed and graphic. And what I wanted to address very quickly with all of us here is the importance of us as parents teaching this to our children. They should learn it from us before they learn it in the schools. And don't think that you can simply take your children out of, uh, you know, out of class that teaches them this, because when they reach other grades and learn biology, they will be taught it as well. So it's a matter of us as parents taking initiative in the education of our children, teaching them about what is permissible and what is not permissible. So I wanted to highlight that, inshallah ta'ala. There's a number of other issues that we can talk about, but of course time doesn't permit. I'm actually really, really tired today, uh, because I took three flights to get here. So we'll open it up for Q&A, because I think Questions are uh, very important, especially with regards to this topic. I have a question for you, if you don't have a question for me, about gender relation. You are at work, or on campus, and someone comes up to you, this happens more at work. It's a woman for the brothers, and it's a man for the sisters. So for the brothers, this woman comes up to you, and she needs to give you a handshake because that's what everyone does at work these days. What do you do? Now, no one thought of asking me that question, so I want you to answer it for me. What do you do? Islamically, are we permitted to shake their hand? Are we permitted to just freely shake the hand of someone else? Now, there's discussion on this. Some scholars say, and there's a very few amount of scholars that say, you know what, if there's no desire involved and it's you know, going to risk your job, then it's okay, but it shouldn't be done. So they just sort of permit it and then just fly over the topic and get to something else. 
But the reality behind it, brothers and sisters, is not permissible. The Prophet ﷺ told us, someone who shakes the hand of someone who is not mahram for them, it's, it, they, it's as though you know, we should take a metal rod and just shove it through your head. That's how severe, you know, it's an analysis that the Prophet ﷺ used to show us the severity of it. That it's going to lead you to a problem. You will do it once and that's it. You will feel that every other time I can do it. And I had this discussion with many brothers, right? Especially when we get together and have dinner. And some brothers say, you know what, I shake hands with women all the time. And we ask that brother, How, what does your wife think about it? Right? How does your wife feel that you're shaking hands with all the other women? He's like, well, I'll let her do it too. I'm like, okay. All right. So there's technically no values there. Right? There's no values. And the two of them have issues. Because when I ask the brother, why do you let your wife do it? He's like, because if I don't let her do it, then she's going to get upset and not want me to do it. So I said, there you go, you brought yourself back to the initial issue. That you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. Right? So what do you do? Ask yourself that. What solutions can you come up with? Shake from a distance. Shake from a distance. Good. He's absolutely right. Some scholars say you shake from a distance, so you don't actually touch their hand. And this is used, uh, it's a technique that's used, especially if you're in front of like a delegate or there's some sort of gathering and there's many people around, you know, you tell them. But this, again, I don't actually like this opinion. Like I don't, uh, I don't encourage it and I don't follow this opinion of the scholars for various reasons. When you're, for example, in front of a bunch of people, and there's media and everyone, and you know, let's just say there's ministers, and they come, you tell them in advance, listen, I'm not going to shake your hand, but we will pretend to shake hands, so it looks like you know, there's no, uh, no differences between us. Well, someone goes and takes a picture, and it seems as though you're shaking that person's hand, and it goes all over the internet. Then what? You're going to say, oh, we never actually shook hands? Or you say, well, look at the picture. It seems very clear. The angle was perfect, it was spot on. So what do you do? I think, um, I don't believe that there is all any, like in any case, there will be an issue of, if I don't shake them the hand, something will happen. So usually what I do is just, I don't shake the hand, I tell them why, tell them I don't shake the hand. And usually they, generally people are more understanding these situations. Good, alhamdulillah, good answer. And that's very true. You know, I was talking to a politician the other day, a Muslim brother. He was a politician. And he told me, he said, he said, as Muslims, we feel scared to express our rights as Muslims. Because we feel as though we came from a different country or our culture is from somewhere else. Even though we might be born here, the culture is different. So we feel as though we're outcasts, as though we're aliens, even though we're right where we were born. And he was telling me that as Muslims, we need to educate the Muslims not to feel that. Express your rights. You're allowed to say that, just like Brother Hisham said. You're allowed to tell someone, listen, I, for religious purposes, I can't shake your hand. They will understand immediately. Now, there's a number of other ways you can do it. Right? Sometimes I say, you know, I don't have any cards on me. Take a business card. They come around to shake your hand. You give them your business card like this with two hands. It's the Malaysian way. You give a business card with two hands. They take it from you. They're so busy looking at a business card, they forget to shake your hand. Right? Or you have a bottle of water or something in your hand right, that you're using. Or you can buy one of these braces and pretend like your hands hurt. <laughs> right? This is a new one. <laughs> My hands actually hurt. <laughs> not pretend. So there's a number of ways, but the best way, brothers and sisters, is to actually say that my religion doesn't permit me to do this. But I greet you and I hope you have a great day or whatever it is that you need to greet them with, right? Why do we do this? Why do, we, why do I recommend that we do this? You're opening a door of da'wah for that person. You're opening a door to teach them about Islam. You're telling them a simple uh, example of your deen, how you have values that I cannot... I can't, I can't shake your hand. You're not halal for me. Right? You're teaching that to them and they become curious. And they will come to you afterwards and ask you why not. And that's your time to actually explain it to them. <coughs> Any other questions? Yes. Uh, 
This is a problem that we face in Western countries, especially. It's uh, regarding the desensitization of our, um, you know, due to, due to uh, the rampant sort of showing of sexual appeal and whatever and on the streets and stuff. So we feel that uh, we are becoming desensitized by these things, and to the point where we don't feel anything at all. Like it doesn't sway us in any way. Or, um, so just comment on you know how we can resolve this issue. Or is it is it possible to go back after this experiencing experiencing you know living here for a few years or a whole life? So the fact that it's like the opposite gender is always in front of you, so you become desensitized. Not just that, but you know the 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 TV, you know what they show.